So the respiration is what? It's an exchange of gases between what? Between the outside of the body and inside of the body, between the outside environment and the internal environment. So I have to move the gases, for example, the oxygen from the atmosphere to the cell. And inside the cell, uh, the mitochondria will take this oxygen to produce energy. And this process will give us CO2. That will go back outside. So all of this process is called respiration, and it has two parts. One, external respiration, two, internal respiration. Internal respiration is at the mitochondrial level. So we will not be talking about it. External respiration has many parts. First is ventilation. What is ventilation? It's the movement of the gases between who and who? Between the atmosphere and the lung, the alveoli. So, this is called the ventilation, and it's a mechanical process. And it has two parts. Those are inspiration and expiration. expiration. Of course, so I can do this ventilation. I need to move the gases from pressures. So I have to have a pressure gradient. I have to have two different pressures, for example, the atmosphere and the alveoli, right? So I have to move the, uh, the gas from high pressure to low pressure. So this is also called convection. So the ventilation is also called the external convection. Next, the gases are in the alveoli. They have to move to the capillary. Now, they also move uh, on, a con on a pressure gradient. You understand? But the distance is small, so we call it diffusion, not convection. So it's alveolocapillar diffusion. Next is the transport of the gases in the blood with the help of the hemoglobin, and you, we will study all the process. And the last one is what? Is the diffusion into the tissue, tissue diffusion. So this is the external respiration. Okay, now we'll be talking about the ventilation. Who do the ventilation? It's the air pump. The air pump is formed by the lungs and the chest wall, the thorax. Now, to understand the ventilation, of course, the lungs is, is connected to the chest wall through the pleura, because the pleura has two parts, visceral part on the lung and uh, parietal part to the chest wall, so they are connected. And between them, there is a cavity called intrapleural cavity that has some fluid. Okay, now to understand the ventilation, you have to understand some basics. First basic is elasticity. What is the meaning of elasticity? It's the ability to extend. So, who are the elastic parts? of the respiratory system, of the air pump, lungs, and chest wall. Okay, what do we know about elasticity? We know about something elastic, that it has a, an initial form, and I can extend it. So this is not the initial form. If I release the energy, it will go back to the initial form. And if I, apply an energy on it, and I'm not in the initial form, a force will appear. A force or a tendency to go back to the initial form. This is called elastic recoil. So the elastic recoil is the tendency to go back to the initial form, to the elastic rest. Now, next, what do you have to know? Okay, the lungs has an initial form. What is the initial form of the lung? So if we take the lungs outside of the chest wall, no energy attached to the lung, the lung will go back to its initial form. Its initial form is collapsed, collapsed. So if I extend the lung, an energy, a force, a tendency will appear, require that will try to do what? To go back to the initial form. 
So the recoil of the lung is it's 10 deci2 collapse. Next, the chest wall has an initial form called expanded, extended. And when I try to make it smaller to, 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 to compress it, what would happen? A recoil will appear that will try to go back to its initial form to extend. So what will happen, what happens exactly in our chest when the lung is already inside the chest wall? And we have here, we have here the lung, the lung L connected to the chest wall C and between them there is a flower. Now, next, this is the initial form of the lung. This is the initial form of the chest wall, the big one. So the lung, when it's connected to the chest wall, it's not in its initial form. It's not collapsed. It's extended a little, right? So it's extended. And the chest wall is not so extended. It's a little smaller. So each one of them, the lung and the chest wall, will have a recoil. So this one is the recoil of the lung. So it, it tends to go back to the initial form. So it tends to collapse. This is the recoil of the lung. And this one will be the recoil of the chest wall. And it will be the tendency to extend. So one more thing now you have to know that there is a state called elastic balance. Elastic balance happens when the lung recoil is equal and in opposite direction to the recoil of the chest wall. When these two find this state, we, we call it the balance state. Okay, let's think about a thing. If, if the lung is empty, collapsed, it will have a volume of 500, for example, milliliter. And if it's extended at the maximum extension, the lung, it will reach this point. And let's say it will have a 5,500 milliliter volume. So in the balance state, how much air is in the lung? We make a formula, a simple formula, that to know the middle part of it. So it will be around 500, 55, 0, 0 plus 500 will give us 6,000 on two. So we will have around three liters, right? So that means that when the lung is connected to the chest wall, I have in my lung around three liters of air all the time. When I take a breath in, for example, of 500 milliliter, I will have 3,500. And when I take a breath out of that 500, I will still have the 3,000 milliliter. Okay, now another thing you have to know here, for example, during inspiration, during inspiration, the lung volume will increase, right? So when the lung volume will increase, what happens to the recoil? of the lung, it will also increase. Why? Because we, we, we are going further away from the rest, elastic rest of the lung. Okay, so if you have a question, like when the recoil of the lung is higher, in the beginning of inspiration or in the end of inspiration, you have to say on the end of inspiration that because the lung volume is larger. Okay, but what if you are asked, what about the recoil of the chest wall? When it's higher, at the beginning of inspiration or at the end of inspiration, what do you say? At the beginning, because at the end of inspiration when the volume of the lungs become bigger it will go close to the rest the initial form of the chest wall so uh, 
the recoil will decrease. So the second most important thing we will be talking about are the pressure. We have to understand the pressures. Why? Because we said the ventilation depends on pressure. So the air must move from a high pressure to the low pressure, right? Okay. Now let's understand this uh, piece of art. What we have here. Here we have the alveoli, okay? And here we have the pleura this time. What, what pleura? The parietal pleura. So this one is the parietal pleura. And this one here is what? Visceral pleura. So what is here between them? The fluid. The fluid. So this is the intrapleural cavity. You understand what I mean? So this is the intrapleural cavity. What is here inside the alveoli, right? So we have to know all the pressures. First, we have first pressure. We have to know it. The atmospheric pressure. It's the summation of the gases in the air, and its value is 760 millimeter mercury, right? Okay, next pressure is inside the alveoli. It's the air that is inside the alveoli. It has a pressure, right? This is called alveolar pressure. Next, next. I have some fluid inside the pleura, right? It has a pressure or not? It has a pressure. It is called intrapleural pressure, PIP. Intrapleural pressure. Okay, there is one more pressure. Any one of you, I think, studied this part. If you have a cavity like this and another cavity inside it, and the first cavity has a pressure, the second cavity has another pressure. This is P2, and here we have a pressure P1. So P1 affects the wall of the second cavity, yes or no? Yes, affects yes. it. It presses it from outside to inside. Is it clear? Now, yes. the pressure in the inside affects the wall of this cavity? Yes, from inside to outside. So here I will have what? A pressure of a wall. The pressure of this wall. Does anyone know the name of the pressure of the wall? It's called transmural pressure. pressure. So the transmural pressure is the pressure of this wall. You understand? And how I calculate this transmural pressure? It's the pressure inside minus the pressure outside. So it's exactly the P2 minus P1. In this case, you understand? <coughs> So here, in our lung, in the alveoli, there is a pressure from inside pressing on the wall? Yeah. Yes, the alveolar pressure. There is a pressure pressing from outside on the wall? Yeah. Yes, the intrapleural pressure. So there is a pressure on the wall? Yes. There is a transmural pressure of the alveoli called the transpulmonary pressure. Clear? So PTP will be what? PA minus PIP, inside minus outside. Okay, we move on. Now, the atmospheric pressure, we said it's 760 millimeter mercury, but it's difficult to calculate everything in millimeter mercury because it's 760. If I add five, it will be 765. Add more 10, it will be 775. It is difficult to say 760, 78, blah, 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 right? So they decided to make it on centimeter water. So the 760 will be at zero centimeter water pressure, okay? So, now, if I say, for example, for example, uh, 753. So it's under or more than 760? 
under. Under. So the value on centimeter water will be under zero. So it will be almost minus 10. You understand? Why? Because I, it's not exactly if you, if, you, if you decrease this by one, this will not decrease by one. It will be decreased by 1.3, something like this. You understand? So if I say, for example, 700, I don't know, 70, it's almost 13 plus what centimeter water. You understand what I mean? It's in positive. So when I see, I don't care about all these values, but I want to ask you something. When you see a pressure minus five, centimeter of water. You know for sure that this pressure is under the atmospheric pressure. It's under 760. It's not actually a really negative pressure. It's only under the atmospheric pressure. That's what the minus means in the centimeter of water. You understand? Next. Now, we have to talk about each of these pressures. We start with the PIP. It's the intrapleural pressure. I call it the big boss. Big boss means uh, because why? Because you will see why. Because it's the only one I can control in the beginning of doing anything. It's the only one that I can control. To do what? If, how can I control the pressure? When I want to do what? Inspiration or expiration. So let's try doing the inspiration. You understand what I mean? Let's try doing the inspiration. And let's see how can I affect the PIP. Okay, we said this is the pleura, parietal pleura, right? This is visceral pleura. Okay, now when I want to do inspiration, my mind will send a signal through a neuron to the spinal cord, for example, and from the spinal cord, it will go to where? To the lungs? No. To the, what you command to do the inspiration? You command your muscle. So the information must go to the muscle, right? So here I have what? Muscle. The muscles are connected to the Parietal pleura, not to the visceral pleura. You understand? So this is the muscle. Okay, and when I command it and tell it make contraction, to make inspiration, you understand what I mean till now? Mm -hmm. The muscle will become shorter. Look at this. If the muscle will, 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 will fractionate the pleura, the parietal pleura, Right? So what will happen to the distance between the two pleuras? When this muscle takes the, this pleura away, the distance will increase. increase. So the pressure inside will decrease. decrease. So inspiration, when I trigger inspiration, what I do to the PIP? Decrease the PIP. I don't care about this mechanism. What you have to remember is that inspiration what decrease PIP. This is what I want you to remember. Inspiration decrease PIP. So expiration increases increases the PIP. Okay. One more thing can affect the PIP. Let's make a drawing first. Let's say this is the lung. So it's uh, surrounded by the visceral pleura. And let's say this is the chest wall surrounded by uh, its pleura, parietal pleura, uh, something like this, okay. Let's think about us staying on orthostatism. So on my feet, what will happen? 
something will affect me. The gravitation. The gravity. So the gravity will pull down what? The lung or the chest wall? The lung. The lung. So the lung will be pulled down. Right? Like this. How I, uh, how I did it in this drone. You understand? What will happen? Well, let's check the pressures, the PIP. Here, how will be the PIP, the pressure? Low. Low. Why? Because the distance between the pleura is high. This is in the apex. What about in the base? It will be high. The PIP will be high. The problem is that you have to remember the values of the PIP, the interpleural pressure. The medium PIP is minus five centimeter water. So in the apex will be lower than minus five, it will be minus 10. And in the base, it will be higher than minus five, it will be minus 2.5. So there is, there is a difference, right? And this difference is, is, is because of the gravity. So there is a gradient or intrapleural pressure about seven centimeter water between the apex and the base. What's the average? What will happen to this PIP differences if I lay down in clinostatism? What do you think? It, the differences will disappear. So the apex will have the same PIP as the base. You understand? So now we move on to the transpulmonary pressure, PTP. Transpulmonary pressure is the transmural pressure of the alveoli. And we said that it's the pressure of this wall. And it is the inside minus outside. So PTP is PA minus PIP. Clear? Now, what do we have to know about the PTP? That it's a static pressure. The meaning of static pressure, static pressure, is not the meaning that it never changed. It means that it does not, uh, it does not uh, determine the air flow. So it does not make air go out or air go in. You understand? So this means static. So what it determines, it determines the volume. So the PTP talks about the volume. Let's see how. What will happen if, for example, I have PTP, right? PTP equals PA minus PIP. What will happen if the PIP will decrease? If PIP will decrease, what will happen to the PTP? It will increase. Increase. Okay. If I decrease the pressure from the outside without affecting the pressure from the inside, the volume will increase. So when the PTP increase, the volume also increase. And when the PTP decreases, the volume will decrease. So one question for you. Oh. Some asked me, okay, of course, if you, if you increase the PA, what happened to the PTP? PA minus PIP also. will also increase. So the volume will also increase. My question is, why we don't say the PIP and the PA are the ones that modify the volume? Why we have to say the PTP? Because, I'll give you an example. If I increase the PIP and I increase the PA in the same amount, the volume will increase or decrease? It will stay the same. Will stay the same. Why it will stay the same? Because the PTP didn't modify. So the one that determines the volume is PTP. The one that determines the volume is the PTP. So if the PTP increase means those two did something to increase the PTP, so the volume will increase. You understand? Okay, last question here. Is the PTP 
how much how how much the PTP B to have the alveoli open and not close? The PTP must be positive. Positive. What is meaning of positive? Means the inside must be higher, higher than the outside. Or else it will collapse. You understand? Do you know a condition in which the alveoli might collapse because the PIP increases and becomes more than the PA? Yes, pneumothorax. When the air comes here. So what the air this will do to the PIP? It will increase the PIP. So it will collapse the alveoli. So I have to do something. What should I do? Take this air and decrease the PIP so I can extend the alveoli. Clear? The alveolar pressure. Now, the last one, the alveolar pressure. The alveolar pressure is very important. And it's a dynamic pressure. Dynamic pressure. So what means dynamic pressure? It means it determines the air flow. It is the one that can make the air move in or move out. Why? Because we said in the beginning, the ventilation is the movement of air between two pressures. What are these two pressures? Atmospheric pressure and alveolar pressure. So to make the air move between alveoli and atmosphere, I have to have a pressure difference between who and who. Atmospheric pressure and alveolar pressure. How, how, what is the value of the atmospheric pressure? Zero, water. Let's say the value of the alveolar pressure is also zero water. Now, in this condition, the air flow is towards the outside or towards the inside? There is no flow. There is no air flow. Why? Because pressures are equal, right? Okay. So now to move the air inside or outside, should I or can I increase, for example, the atmospheric pressure? No, I'm not no. Ma magneto. No, or I don't know who can control the pressure of the outside. Whatever. What pressure should I modify to move the air? The one in the alveolar. Alveolar pressure. If I make the alveolar pressure, for example, plus 10, what happens to the air? It will move out. Will move out. We will have flow towards the outside. But if I make it minus 10, what will happen to the air? Comes in. It will come in. So if I decrease the PA, the air will come in. If I increase the PA, the air will go out. You understand? Okay, that's it. Now, how I begin the inspiration? How I begin the inspiration? Begin inspiration. I will affect a pressure. What pressure? We said we can affect only one pressure. Which one? PIP with the muscle. So what I do to the PIP? Decrease. PIP will do what? Decrease, right? This will do what? If the PIP will be decreased, what happened to the PTP? Decreases. Increase. increase. PTP Please. will increase, right? If PTP will increase, what happened to the volume? Increase. Volume will increase. If the volume of the alveoli starts to increase, the air in the alveoli has a pressure. But if the volume increases, what happens to the pressure? Decreases. Will decrease. So PA will decrease. 
What will happen if the PA will, will, will decrease? It becomes minus 10. What will happen? A flow to towards what? The inside. Do you understand? Yes. Yes. How I begin the expiration? Okay, I affect what? Pass. I pressure. PIP. The inspiration and the expiration affects one in the beginning. Which one? PIP. So I said it's a big boy. PIP will increase. Increase. So PTP will decrease. Decrease. So volume will decrease. Okay. So it will compress the alveoli. What will happen to the pressure inside? Um, it will increase. So we will have air flow towards what? Outside. 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 Is it clear? Okay. And here you have everything written, I think. So now I will talk a little about the inspiration and expiration. We have uh, two types of uh, inspiration and expiration. When I make quiet breathing, so I make a quiet inspiration and a quiet what? Expiration, right? To make a quiet inspiration, do I activate any muscles? Yes, I contract some muscles. What muscles? Primary muscles. What are the primary muscles? Inspiratory muscles, the diaphragm and the external intercostal. Is it clear? Okay, but when I want to do the quiet expiration, I actually what? Relax the primary inspiratory muscle, the diaphragm and the external intercostal. So I will do the external. Uh, the quiet expiration. Now, can I do a forest inspiration? Yes. <gasps> so do I activate the primary muscles, the diaphragm and intercostals? Yes, I do. But I also activate another muscles called what? Secondary muscles like scalenes and SCM. Okay, SCM, sternocleidomastoid and muscle. Now, and the anterior serratus. Now, those are called what? Secondary muscles. So secondary and primary are activated when we have forced inspiration. What about forced expiration? Do you activate any muscle? Try exhaling all the air in. Do you feel something contracted? Yes, the abdominal muscle and what? Interior intercostal. Those are called accessory expiratory muscles. So if they ask you in your exam, the accessory expiratory muscles are activated during forced inspiration. Correct or false? False. False. They are active only during false X. Inspiration. Okay. Now, before, uh, let's talk about the PIP. We say the pressure, the intrapleural pressure, is minus five, right? So when I do inspiration, the PIP will decrease. Okay, in quiet inspiration, it will decrease to minus 7.5. So not a lot, a lot. But when I do a maximum expiration, uh, inspiration, it will decrease to minus 30. And it will increase when I do a expiration. It can become positive only by doing a forced what? Expiration. Okay, so consider this a uh, lung. And I want to know how much air I have in the lung before to start to breathe the quiet breathing. For example, how much? you think we have? It's like this, about two, three liters, 3,000. 
the one that we studied in the beginning, the balance volume, okay? So, look at this one. Now I am here, okay? So this colored part of the lung is filled with air. You understand what I mean? Now I want to make what? Inspiration, quiet inspiration, quiet inspiration. How much air I take in? 500. 500 minutes. Look. Oh. Then I do what? Quiet expiration. Quiet inspiration, quiet expiration, quiet inspiration, quiet expiration. So the air that moves in and out during quiet breathing is called tidal volume. And it's how much is it? 500 milliliters. So, quiet inspiration, quiet expiration, quiet inspiration, quiet expiration. Now, I'm doing quiet inspiration. Can I do a forced inspiration? <gasps> yes or no? Yes. Yes. <sighs> so, the air that I can make it that I can breathe it in during fast expiration. What is it called? This one. This one. The air that I can breathe it during what? Fast <sighs> inspiration. It's called what? IRV. What is the IRV? Inspiratory reserve volume. You understand? Now, I go back to here. Now, I breathe in, out, in, out, in, and out. Now, can I take the out more air? Yes. Yeah. I can take everything out or not everything? Not everything. Not everything. The one that I can take it out uh, through force expiration is called what? Expiration reservoir. ERV, expiratory reserve volume. And the air that remains in the lung after the maximum expiration is called? Fresh volume. Residual volume, RV. Is it clear? So RV is the quantity of air that remains in the lung after I make a force and maximum expiration. Is it clear? Okay, now. The air that remains in the lung after a quiet expiration is what and what? So I'm the quiet inspiration, quiet expiration. What is the air in the lung now? Tell me. ERV and RV. ERV and RV. RV. Those two are the balance volume, but we have we, they, we have another name. What is the other name? FRC. So you understand? So the FRC is the quantity of the air that remains in the lung after a quiet inspiration, correct or false? No, after a quiet uh, inspiration, no. I'm here. After a quiet what? Expiration. Expiration, I'm here. Is it clear? Now, we have to study one more thing. Okay, from this position, from FRC position, if I breathe in all the air that I can breathe it in, this, it's what and what? TV, tidal volume, and inspiratory reserve volume. This is called inspiratory capacity. This is called what? Inspiratory capacity. Okay, what is the total air that I can breathe in and out? 
For example, if I breathe in everything and out everything, what is the air that I can breathe in and out? All the air that I can breathe in and out is called what? Vital capacity. What is vital capacity? Tidal volume plus IRV plus ERV. You understand? For example, if I tell someone, breathe in everything, then take everything out. Everything, everything. So it's everything except what? Residual volume. What if I add the residual volume to it? So the vital capacity and the residual volume will give us what? Total lung capacity. You understand? So if I say someone at total lung capacity position, so it's air full. Someone at residual volume position, so it's the lowest. This. Is it clear? Fine. You also have to know some values. For example, the residual volume is like one letter to two letters. You understand? And with age, when you get older, the residual volume will increase and the vital capacity will decrease and the inspiratory capacity will decrease. You also have to know FRC positions, uh, FRC modification. For example, I don't know, woman, man, you know, man have uh, more FRC than woman and something like that. Of course. Well, let's talk about the compliance now. The compliance. What is the compliance? It's the distensibility. It's how easy you extend the lung. You understand? Okay, so you have to increase what? The volume. How I increase the volume? By increasing what? PTP. PTP. So, the compliance is how much volume it increases when I increase one PTP. Is, is it clear? If, some vo if I increase one PTP and the volume increases by 400 milliliters, or another example, I increase one PTP and the volume increases by 50 milliliters, which one has higher compliance? A or B? A. A. So this is it. Higher compliance means I increase a little PTP and the volume gets higher. That's all. So the, PT, the, PT, the compliance is delta what? V. How much the volume is increased. When I increase what? PTP. That's all. Now, so to understand the compliance, I have to do two things. What? Th this and this. So I increase what? PTP. To increase what? The volume. the volume. So let's think here. If I increase the PT PTP must be positive somewhere from here. If I increase the PTP from here to here, you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. I increase the PTP from here to here. What do you, you will think will happen to the volume? will increase, right? But in this situation, the increasement of volume is only from here to here. It's a lot or not? What? Not so much, you understand? So here, in the vo when the volume is low, when the lung volume is low, if I increase the PTP, the volume will not increase a lot. So the compliance is low. So here the compliance is low. Next, if I continue increasing the PTP from here to here, I increase the PTP more, what will happen to the volume? Increase. But a lot. So at medium volumes, medium volumes like FRC, you know, FRC is medium volume. RV is Small volume. So at RV, how is the compliance? Low. Low. At FRC, medium volume, how is the compliance? 
high. And when I reach almost the total line capacity, it means here, if I increase the PTP even further, I will not get a lot of increase of the volume. You understand? So at near the TLC, I mean near the total line capacity, the, the compliance is also low. low. So this is the pattern of the compliance. Okay, now you have to study another one more thing. And this is uh, the compliance is inverse of the elastance or the re resistance. And the resistance is given by two things. What? Elastic fibers, right? And surface tension. Let's talk about the elastic fibers. Do you know a pathology that increases the elastic fibers? Hmm? Or not exactly only elastic fibers. It will change the elastic fibers to collagen fibers, for example. Do you understand? More fibers. What is this pathology? More fibers. Fibrosis. Fibrosis. So first condition is fibrosis. More fiber. So more what? Recoil. Yes, more recoil, more resistance. So, how is the compliance? Less. Hello. Yeah. So, I need a higher or lower pressure to expand the lung? More pressure. More pressure. So, the curve will move to the right to, to more PTP to expand the lung. This is what pathology? Fibrosis. So the compliance in fibrosis is low. Is it clear? Next pathology is when you destroy the fibers. Do you destroy the fibers? The elastic fibers are destroyed. The alveoli can expand easy now because no recoil. What is this pathology? It's called M. Emphysema. Emphysema destroying the fiber. So now, when I increase a little pressure, what happened to the volume? It will increase. Increase. So the compliance actually is what high. But here, of course, here I am talking about something called static compliance. Next time I will explain to you the, the difference between static compliance and dynamic compliance, not now. Okay, is it clear? Yeah. Now let's talk about the surface tension. We said that if we have surface tension, an increased surface tension will also increase the resistance, will also decrease the compliance. So let's talk about the surface tension. First, let's say this is an alveoli. And inside the alveoli, everyone knows there are cells, right? What are the names of the cells in the alveoli? Pneumocytes. And we have pneumocytes type one, pneumocytes type two. Pneumocytes type one function is to transport the gases, right? So for example, if oxygen comes from here, it must come through the pneumocytes to go to the capillary, right? Okay. But to transport the oxygen, I need first to solubilize the oxygen, to make it soluble. So in the alveoli, there is a little water or fluid that solubilizes the gases to make it diffusion. Okay, now my question for you. So if you have here a molecule of water, one molecule of water here and one here, and one here, and one here, and one here. So uh, there are a little droplets of droplets of water in a cavity, and the air come to them. What will happen to these molecules of water when air are, is in contact with them? They will try to gather. When you put some water droplets. And you look at them, you will see that the water droplets, what will happen to them? They will come together, right? So the water droplets trying to come together. So a bond will form. 
Between what and what? Between one molecule of water and second, right? This one, a cohesion force, adhesion force between the molecules of water, when there is an air coming to them, this is called what? Surface tension, this bond. So this bond of molecule and water that comes, 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 comes together, this will come, 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 come. What will do to the pressure inside the alveoli? Okay, I will ask you another thing. What it will do to the volume of the alveoli? It will increase or decrease the volume of the alveoli? It will try to come together like this. Try to come together, try to come together. Decrease. So yes, it will decrease. So what will happen to the pressure? Of the air, of course. The pressure of the air will Increase. Increase. What also will you will know? What happened to the radius? Radius. Decrease. Decrease. So the surface tension tends to what? Decrease the radius and increase the pressure. There is a problem if I increase the pressure. Yes, the air will. To go out. What will happen to the alveoli? Collapse. 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 So there is one mechanism to prevent this. What is this mechanism that prevents this? It's called the surfactant. The surfactant is mostly a phospholipid, so it has two parts: hydrophilic and hydrophobic so the hydrophilic will sit on on the on toward the water and the hydrophobic towards the air so the air will not come in contact with the water so the molecules will not come in contact with each other so the surface tension will decrease so the compliance will increase increase so the pressure will decrease so the surfactant makes the pressure equal in the alveoli let's see what okay this is easy now if i ask you one thing if i have a small alveoli and a big alveoli where is the surface tension higher in the small or in the big alveoli the big what is the surface tension the connection between the water molecule together. So where is this connection stronger? In the small one. In the small one. So here I have the surface tension high. Here the surface tension is low. So which one of them has the risk to collapse? Small one. The small one. Clear? Okay. So we add the surfactant. We add surfactant here, surfactant here, surfactant here, surfactant here, surfactant here. And here we add surfactant. If you look at the surfactants in the small and the large alveoli, where do you think we have more surfactant? In the small? They are equal in number, but density of the surfactant is more in the small one clear so the effect of the surfactant is better where in the small one to prevent the air contacting that to decrease the surface tension you understand so this one will not collapse and the air will not go to the next one so the pressure here must be equal to the pressure here is it clear? Okay, this is the function of the surfactant. Of course, we have to talk more about the surfactant. The surfactant is uh, synthesized when? When it started, starts to synthesize. Uh, in the intrauterine life, in the last trimester, so from the seventh to seventh month, eighth month, you understand? 
So the surfactant starts to um, maturization to, to, to develop from seventh, eighth, ninth month. So if a child a new, is born in the seventh month, what will happen to this child? How is the surfactant in this child? Lower or normal? Lower surfactant. So how is its compliance? No, how is its surface tension? Surface tension is High. higher. So its compliance is lower. So this kid may not open its alveoli. He cannot extend his lung. So this, is, we, we, this will be called what? Respiratory depressa of the newborn. So this newborn has to stay in the hospital, to be taken care of, for, to give him to give him, you, know, you understand, to help him breathe until he has sufficient what? Surfactant. Do you understand? Oh, okay, next. Next is another thing about the surfactant. Surfactant is mostly by, formed by lipids and some proteins. The lipids are phospholipids. Phosphatidylcholine, dipalmetylphosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylglycerol. The proteins are some of them are mm, plasma proteins. Some of them are surfactant proteins. And we have four types of surfactant proteins. A, B, C, surfactant protein A, surfactant protein B, C, and D. Two of them are hydrosoluble, A and D. Two of them are liposoluble, B and C. Yeah. And it can be involved in the immunity, the A and D. Okay, what are the cells that make surfactant? You will have the, the most important cell that makes surfactant is pneumocyte type 2. And it puts the surfactant into the vesicle. The vesicle of the surfactant inside the pneumocyte type 2 is called lamellar body. When it is released in the alveoli and it, is, it makes the layer of surfactant, it will be called what? Tubular myelin. What will happen now? This tubular myelin starts to to, to yeah, surfactant start to decrease, to destroy, to alter. So macrophages will come and eat it. And the pneumocytes and other cells like Clara will make new surfactant. So surfactant is all, always uh, uh, remade. Is it clear? Okay. And that's it for today. We'll continue next time.